uh, the anxiety uh, in the northeast, particularly in Assam, is you know primarily also to do with this whole issue of uh, giving benefit to a very small exclusive group at the cost of you know inflicting environmental and social uh, damage or risk to a much larger community, which is the local community. And that is why this whole conflict is coming up. And uh, as a part of so-called uh, corporate social responsibility, most of these project authorities are you know, spelling out uh, building of hospitals, schools, and also even providing free energy, free power to the downstream people, not necessarily connected to the main grid, because that cannot be done at a local, because these are all discrete art isolated villages. But even giving alternative you know, sources, even maybe local micro hydro or solar or something which is being talked about, we are not very clear as of now how it will be achieved and done. But the point still remains that without giving a local social benefit, if, you know, the, the power requirement of Assam for right now is about less than 1,000 megawatt. Now, you are going to produce 60,000 megawatt. Very clearly, already the towers are being built that this may be projected, you know, Northeast uh, or Assam will need maybe 2,000 megawatt in another 10, 20, 30 years, or maybe 3,000 megawatt, 5,000 megawatt. But what about the remaining 55,000 megawatt being taken to mostly for the benefit of the metros and the industries elsewhere in the country? Why this is happening? As I was showing you that flood event, you know, um, that people are getting killed. Most of the time, through media also, the Northeast issues are not really they do not really become national issues even this whole discourse of um, you know hydropower is going on sort of not much discussed at a national forum so as a result of that the feeling of anxiety is rooted in the fact that okay earlier there was a oil production there are tea and now power all are being taken away from northeast for the benefit of a larger you know exclusive group in some cities and places elsewhere in the outside the northeast but the local benefits are not really coming and if coming also it's very very in trickles so that is a one of the major concern that the social benefits accruing out of these projects are not really equitably divided and obviously this this resentment will always remain you know and this has also remained at the root of this whole problem of insurgents and other problems in the north is one has to really look at in a very very pragmatic collective way that this sense of isolation and alienation should not be fueled or you know encouraged anymore in fact it should be the other way around somewhere a friend said you know if the north is not really kind of coming to the mainstream so to say it is the mainstream who should now go to the north east and approach them you know somewhere share the concern and the problems of north is like the lucas policy we said that the lucas policy is just on paper nothing is happening much is it possible that water diplomacy could be one good route of getting you know reinforcement or strength to the lucas policy because after all water is a common pool of resource and shareable resource with the southeast asian countries which does not have a administrative or political or you know international border so these are some of the things going on uh, we really don't see clearly also sitting at Guwahati or in Assam that exactly from the national perspective uh, what exactly is happening. I think these forums are important in that sense that you know some of you perhaps can take this a little forward, make it a part of a national discussion somewhere, a pragmatic and objective way of looking at it. Not We, we do understand that sitting in the north is somebody has written a newspaper article recently that you know in the national anthem none of the name of the north east states are there it has to be redrafted now i'm sure this is not possible you know but at the same time these sort of sentiments are in the rise and this is not good for the overall national perspective so somewhere i think unfortunately not too many voices are also coming to the national level to make these discourses part of the national discourses but somewhere one has to you know take note of this and i'm sure in slowly like today i think discussion is one of the example thanks to mr Ayer, that i am coming here talking not necessarily someone from assam but kind of flagging the issue that some of these points have to be taken maybe at a little larger level you know and make part of the overall planning process if possible hi after 
all the expert and distinguished speakers have spoken, I feel a little nervous. But looking at the micro picture, there was the statistics that you said that uh, the per capita water availability is about 18,400 meter cube. Simple calculation, it comes down to 50,000 liters a day per person. Oh, how do you define water availability given that it's majorly rural areas and only 80 liter to 100 liter per day is getting consumed? Where is all that water going? Is it just technical or geographical constraint or is it just mismanagement? And what proportion? Deriving from this, um, the reason why I'm asking this question is that from the entire presentation or all the other papers that I've read, uh, read on the water issues, there's this basic issue of governance. I'm not talking about the dams as such, but basic issue of governance that I think we have policies, we have planners, we have so many commissions that are there, we have studies, but what happens at the ground level? How does it translate down to the level, um, the ground level, the management issue, the administration issue, the basic governance issue? What are we doing with all these studies that have been carried out for all these years? even when we are talking about the environmental issues, even when we are talking about the social issues, how much of it is getting into the action? I mean, that proportion is extremely low. Isn't our execution and implementation which is extremely flawed and that needs to be looked into? The insurgency issues, the political discourses, everything. I mean, the planning has to incorporate that particular aspect as well, besides the scientific knowledge, besides the technical knowledge how much of it is getting into the action? Um, so that's basic uh, question that I have to you. One is, how are we defining water availability? And second is the governance issue. How are we dealing with that? You are very right that, you know, there is a need of a deeper, um, very pragmatic engagement into the, you know, water issues in the Northeast. Um, because the per capita availability, so to say, is that quantum of water coming in the river system. And as somebody puts it, that going west to the sea, through Bangladesh, you know. Primarily the problem is that we are not being able to tap it. It flows, 90% of the flow in the Brahmaputra system happens during the monsoon four months, and it just goes to the sea. Because it's flood, we cannot, you know, tap that water, we cannot take it to the supply. As of now, in the Assam, there are a lot of areas where we don't have safe, good quality drinking water. Now, while the Brahmaputra is just flowing, you know, so the issue, as you have rightly pointed out, that technologically or more importantly, governance-wise, managerially, we have not been able to take that water, treat it, and supply to the consumers. So, as of the total mass of water flowing by, divided by the population, per capita, potential availability is so much. But in reality, none of this water is actually reaching to the people. Forget about drinking, even other uses also. So, what we need is that, you know, perhaps, I mean, as I pointed out, that the Ganga River Basin Authority, from a point of view of quality improvement and all that happening, maybe for a Brahmaputra system, it's a different perspective, but still somebody has to sit down, have a proper resource center or a, you know, an engagement of a proper river basin organization to see that what to do with this whole quantum of colossal water that we have. It is also very wrong to say that the water is going west to the sea because after all, it is enriching the coastal system and we should not forget the whole eastern coast of India is also getting the benefit of Bay of Bengal, getting all the fresh water nutrient supply from the river Brahmaputra down below. It's not only Bangladesh that it is gaining out of, you know, after Bangladesh, again, it is going to the Bay of Bengal only and knowing very well that the primary productivity of Bay of Bengal is still much lower compared to the Arabian Sea in terms of fish population and all that. So there is a need. But the main issue is that perhaps so far we have not really looked into the Brahmaputra system water resource in a pragmatic manner in terms of total mass balance available, how much of the groundwater, how much is surface water, what needs to be the priority in terms of you know water for life, water for livelihood, water for recreation and other means. And um, I have already added also that a lot of people in Assam are drinking arsenic water. You know, so right now after our, some of the studies, we are now thinking of taking drinking water. There's a uh, 100 crore rupees scheme coming up some of the arsenic uh, affected cluster of villages. But only now, there are many more who are still not getting good quality water. The only problem with Brahmaputra water, I said, is one is that the river course is very irregular. So sometime, you know, the intake point is left dry. 
So many of the drinking water, surface water supply system fails because the source dries up or the river gets shifted somewhere. Number two, there is a huge bacteriological pollution problem. So you need a proper treatment. You know, as a public good, water is always a public good. But in the wetland, in the pond, if you have to process and then refine and disinfect and supply it to the consumer, a cost is involved and that cost has to be borne by somebody. It is not super clearly defined even in the draft state water policy that what is the benchmark who will get free water, free drinking water, who will get you know at a particular incremental cost in a ceiling based depending on the you know, amount of use. Those things are still not in place. So I hope that somewhere down the line we should have maybe the 12 plan in the planning commission can think of keeping aside a small amount of money of having a national level water resource institute somewhere in Assam because after all 35% water is locked there and they can develop a whole national level plan. I feel considering the state of Ganga and other rivers in India, Brahmaputra is the future water bank for all of India. If we can actually exploit this whole about couple of hundred billions of billion cubic meter of water of Brahmaputra for the wherever possible by pipeline or whatever we can supply to rest of India, it can become a very good resource. But somebody has to sit down and do this whole arithmetic and the planning that how, where, considering all the you know irregularity of our terrain and all that, Brahmaputra as a resource, and I hope people like you maybe take a little lead into looking into Brahmaputra a little more, uh, you know, positively in the sense that what the best it can uh, come out of it, keeping in mind, of course, interest of Bangladesh and others also, obviously. So this is not, as, a, as you have pointed out, has not happened so far, but uh, there's no doubt keeping in mind climate change and other issue, glacial melting. Uh, of course, we don't have a uh, much glacial contribution compared to the Western Himalaya and the Eastern Himalaya. Most of the Eastern Himalayan rivers are actually monsoon fed, you know, rainwater fed compared to glacial melt. Uh, but we should not forget that Brahmaputra also, like Ganga, flows also during the winter. Now, in the winter, where the water comes from? You know, if glacials are not contributing, where they are? They are mostly in the whole groundwater regime in the hills. They are mostly in the canopy, in the forest. That keeps trickling out the water even during the dry season. Quantum is less, but the water is still flowing. We are now saying with climate change, is it possible somebody is you know, painting a doomsday picture that the Brahmaputra will become a desert during the dry season. Now, is it a reality or one has to really look into it, you know, and what exactly happens if really that sort of a situation arises? So how we sustain the water flow through Brahmaputra all throughout the year as a resource for, if not the whole nation, maybe the whole northern India or part of eastern and northern India can get fresh water supply from there. And we must sustain that the water supply remains and how now deforestation is happening. Forest canopy is gone. Along with that, our capturing water capacity is also going, you know. One has to recognize that how much is actually contained in that. So if we have even evapotranspiration, what amount of water will still remain there, which will sustain the winter flow, which is actually a big concern, you know. In monsoon will have a intensified flooding, but it seems that the water availability window during winter if you believe all the climate change predictions, is definitely going to be modified. To what extent, we really don't know, but there is definitely an element of risk involved, and one has to really look into that. We have not done much of science about it so far. It's very, very less compared to the, the challenges involved, actually. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chandan Mitra, just you pointed out the nitrogen water is going to sea and mismanagement. Or Do you think that the way NDA government, Vajpayee government had the plan to have a linking of the rivers, that is one of the solution or it's, there are other, other solutions also? <laughs> uh, see, conceptually, that plan looked very grandiose and very useful. But as you know, already we had a long discourse, the ecological and other challenges. Simply if you take the sediment issue, the kind of canals we are planning to build from Brahmaputra, you know, you will need a continuous energy power supply to run dressers to keep dressing the canals because it will be filled with sediment. What you are going to do about that? So it will not be kind of, a, you know, if we look at a sectorial way to the problem, it will not help. If at all, maybe the, again, I, I can maintain like that, that somewhere it, there may be a feasibility. One has to examine, one has to see what is the cost benefit, what is you are getting out of how much. If you have to put more power simply to maintain the canals, 
then you know you are getting out of the hydropowers that are, it doesn't make sense. So I think a lot has been discussed on that. There is a whole ecological issue, and particularly if you think of this whole cocktailing of say mixing Ganga water with Brahmaputra, what then it does to this whole river dolphin and the other issues? How much we really compromise in terms of the ecological integrity of these rivers? These are issues which have not been so far quantified. You know, so we don't really know as of now. Somebody has to put a great deal of time and effort and science to understand that and then only it should be decided. There is no clear yes or no answer to that really.